Tarde. Um, it is very, it is a wonderful uh, experience for us to be here with you all. And I want to thank Theo Cruz for organizing it, especially Maria and Andre, and also all of you for coming. So I'm Christine Grady. I'm going to speak about, um, I'm going to talk about an introduction to the ethical principles in clinical research. But I noticed this morning when Laura Lee asked everybody how many had written protocols, how many had um, read protocols, I want to ask you to raise your hands if you've never thought about an ethical issue in research. Okay. I'm assuming that every single person in this room who's involved with research in one way or the other um, has experienced either classes in ethics, uh, rules in ethics, uh, complexities in ethics that, that you've thought about. Um, and maybe some of you, I know I certainly have, uh, have spent wakeless nights thinking about some of the ethical conundrums that you face in your research. So what I'd like to do this afternoon with, with all of you is think together about how research can be ethical, what we need to do in order to make sure it's ethical, and um, also some of the challenges in doing so. So, and I welcome your comments as we go. So, no one else had this disclaimer, but I work for the federal government and I did not have to have my slides approved. Therefore, what I'm saying is, are my views and nobody else's. And I have no conflicts to disclose to you. So I want to start by recognizing, I think everyone will recognize, that clinical research is often viewed by people as this sort of terrible kind of human experimentation, where we take people and we make them into guinea pigs to try to figure out something. And I think the, the general public has a very um, limited understanding of what research is, why we do it, and how we do it. So that's a challenge. We also have a further challenge in that clinical research is a, an endeavor that aims to generate useful knowledge, knowledge that can help us understand human health, help us prevent and treat and diagnose diseases and, pr and uh, promote health in other ways. But it requires experimenting on human beings. It does require that we use human beings to do experiments. And so that sets up a problem right away, a moral problem. One, of the, one piece of that problem is that benefit to the individuals that we ask to participate in our trials is not the goal. It's not the reason we're doing research. And so right away, people who are asked to participate in our studies are at least susceptible to the possibility of exploitation, susceptible, susceptible to being used as a means for somebody else's ends um, and, and exploited in the development of knowledge. So I think there, there are actually two questions that we should think about when we think about how, whether clinical research is ethical. The first is not often talked about, but I think it's an interesting uh, first threshold question, and that is, should we do research with human beings? Should we experiment on human beings? And that's a threshold question. If the answer to that is yes, then the question is, how? How should we do it? And most of the literature, most of the guidance, most of the discussions that we have about the ethics of doing research fall into the second question. I want to spend just a, sec a minute talking about the first one first. So why do we do clinical research? Why do we do research with human beings? Some of the speakers this morning, um, including Dr. Stabelli, mentioned this. There are incredibly useful gains that we have come by through doing research in understanding human health, in being able to help people live longer, healthier lives, lower morbidity, lower mortality. A lot of that has been through things that we've learned by doing research on human beings. So much of my previous clinical work was in HIV disease. Look at where we've come from the day, the, the uh, publication that Jerry mentioned in 1981 when we first noticed um, pneumocystis carini in, in uh, homosexual men to today where we have I think the number is like 30 
drugs that have been approved to treat HIV and, and they work pretty well. People can live an almost normal life on HIV uh, antiretrovirals. The other thing is we sometimes forget that in the delivery of care, clinicians actually don't know what to do unless there's some evidence to help them. So they can actually do harm to people treating them inappropriately and they can actually help people by treating them appropriately based on evidence, but the evidence has to be generated. And so we do research to make sure that clinicians know how to treat people safely and effectively. I think it's also worth recognizing that clinical research actually also has some other important benefits. Um, one that's been, I think, m more recently recognized are economic benefits. And it's not just to the companies that make interventions that hit a, a good market. It's to economic benefits in terms of training, in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of lots of things that actually bring a good outcomes to people outside of the actual conduct of research, or because of the actual conduct of research. So I think based on those things, there's a pretty good argument that research ought to be done, and research ought to be done with human beings. So then the question is how? Um, and we have developed, or the world has developed, and there's a lot of agreement across borders, actually, um, ethical requirements that allow us to promote the responsible conduct of useful clinical research while protecting, that, that helps us uh, achieve progress in understanding and treating human diseases, um, while at the same time minimizing the possibility of exploitation in research and ensuring that the rights and the welfare of the people that we invite to participate with us are protected. Um, and this also, all of these things help us to maintain the public's trust in, in research so that the idea that this is just you know, experimenting a, on guinea pigs, using humans to be guinea pigs, I think is decreased the more we're able to show that research has good outcomes and that we do it responsibly. So I like to think of the ethics of clinical research as this balance, and, and I'm going to refer to this balance throughout the rest of my discussion this afternoon that it is both ethically responsible research, both promotes benefits to society and to future patients and to other patients by doing good, useful clinical research, while at the same time uh, protecting the rights and the welfare of the participants that we invite to, to be part of that journey. And this is a balance that has a lot of uh, challenges to it, but is something that we should always keep in mind because we really are trying to do both. So I want to spend just a few minutes. I'm not going to do much history. You had a really nice uh, history um, this morning from Dr. Gallen. But I think just like clinical research has a history, so does the understanding of how we ethically do research have a history. And so for probably centuries, uh, actually millennia, based on some of the examples that were provided, there were very few rules. People, physicians experimented they governed themselves or they governed each other. There was some peer censorship and things like that. But there were very few rules. And some research was done with the idea of benefiting individuals. So if it, for example, uh, Dr. Gallen talked about um, um, <laughs> Pasteur. Uh, Pasteur, one of his first adventures with testing the rabies vaccine was in a young boy who was bitten by a dog and was presumed to go presumably going to die, and they brought him to Pasteur and said, please, please put this rabies vaccine into this child to see if it would make him better. Um, and, you know, luckily it did. And so history judged that experiment positively. Now you can imagine if, if it had come out the other way, history might have judged that experiment in a different way. And there are some people who have written actually quite critically about Pasteur's experiment. That, over many decades or centuries or millennia of no rules, um, entered a stage that, that, at least in the United States, people have referred to as the utilitarian era. And this was an era when many people were, in, were used in the conduct of research because they were considered maybe less important to society in some way. 
that we could in, in use them in research and answer important questions for everybody else, but they didn't have that much social capital. So for example, prisoners were often used in research. People who lived in orphanages or homes for the mentally ill. There were many studies that were done um, with uh, populations of that type. That led in the 60s and 70s to uh, an era where a lot of previous research sort of was exposed to the public and there was this sort of um, media exposure but also a lot of discussion and a lot of horror among scientists about the kinds of research that was being done, the kinds of methods that we allowed and we tolerated and we thought were, some people thought were okay. Um, and it, it, it led to, in the 60s and 70s, an examination of the scope of and the limitations of allowable ethical research. Um, in, in the United States, for example, the study that sort of, the pinnacle of that time was the Tuskegee syphilis study which led to the creation of a uh, commission that was appointed by the US Congress and a set of rules that we still actually operate under that um, were generated from that era. So after the scandals and many of the scandals and these sort of utilitarian uh, types of research were exposed, uh, a number of rules and regulations were put into place. And the rules and regulations were focused on the need to protect people, protect the human participants in this endeavor called research. So it was the balance that I had mentioned earlier was, was out of whack. You know, the, the possibly the benefit to um, the future or to science was uh, being overemphasized and the rights and the welfare of some of the participants was being underemphasized. And so the rules and regulations that were put into place were all meant to try to protect the participants, to find ways to make their experience less uh, dangerous or less risky um, in many respects. I think in the last couple of decades, there has been a little bit of a pendulum swing in terms of how people see research. And some of that was, again, in the United States, generated by AIDS activism, that there, was, there were arguments that, you know, if you keep me out of the study, you're denying me access to the potentially useful therapies that are being developed. Um, and so um, that was unethical to keep me out, even though you're keeping me out because you're so-called protecting me. Um, research with children was begun to be seen as incredibly beneficial to the, to the ability of clinicians to treat children, whereas before we were always protecting children from, or the rules were all about protecting children from research. I think uh, in the international context, there were many communities around the world who said, we want research. We want research in our community. We want to understand how these things work in our context. And it was seen as a, a benefit, a way to understand the particulars of the context and to um, move progress forward in healthcare. And so there's a little bit of a, a swing in terms of perception. I think most of the rules and regulations that exist still emphasize protection. So what are some of those rules? I'm sure these are familiar to almost everyone. Um, the Nuremberg Code, which came out of World War II, which was a list of rules that um, emphasized the informed consent of in, a voluntary consent of individuals, but it also talked about the importance of uh, doing research that was um, good for society, had fruitful results. It also talked about limiting risks, that there should never be uh, research done that had you know, long-term uh, devastating effects or the chance of death, unless the investigators were also uh, participants in the trial. Um, and there were a number of other things in the Nuremberg Code that, that were really influential in terms of beginning the discussion about what the, they were, it wasn't the first code of ethics everywhere, anywhere, for research, but it really began the discussion internationally about how people should think about doing ethical research. The Declaration of Helsinki followed in 1964, so it was almost 15 years later, but it really was an effort that began in response to the Nuremberg Code. 
It was um, the World Medical Assembly or Association are, uh, is a group of, of medical associations from various countries in the world. And that organization wanted to think together about, okay, how is research where doctors are treating patients different from what Nuremberg was about, which was about prisoners in a, in a very difficult situation in a war zone. And so the Declaration of Helsinki was written for doctors, and doctors who do research with patients. And it has been, as you probably all know, a living document in the sense that it has been revised at least seven times, most recently in 2013. Um, and it's revised every few years through lots of consultations with people around the world. And there's been some pretty substantial changes to it over the, since 1964. I'm not going to talk more about it, but I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. The CIOMS or, and WHO, CIOMS is the Council of International Organizations of Medical Sciences. Um, and that's an organization that worked with the World Health Organization to try to look at the principles that were enunciated in the Declaration of Helsinki and uh, spell out how they might apply to the kind of research that was beginning to grow in the, in the 80s and 90s, and that was uh, research across borders, where you might have partners on different side of a geographic border, but you might have partners who also had different levels of resources to bring to the table. And SEAMS has been a very influential document around the world because it has, it has detailed explanations for how they come up with their guidance. There's also um, ICHGCP, which is the International Conference on Harmonization Good Clinical Practice Guidelines, which, is, which was an attempt by a number of countries around the world to, to harmonize their regulatory requirements so that if you did a study in one jurisdiction, you could, that data could be accepted in another jurisdiction and not have to go through the whole series of clinical trials in order to get approved. I think it's been a very influential document. It has some uh, limitations in terms of how much it talks about ethics, um, but it does refer actually to the Declaration of Helsinki in its GCP. There are also, in addition to codes of ethics, there are also regulations. So in the United States, we basically f follow two sets of regulations. Uh, there are actually more than two, but at least two. Uh, some are under the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and this is the set of regulations that Jerry's office actually regulates. Um, and in our context, it's called the common rule because it applies to a number of different federal agencies. But anyone who gets money from one of the US federal agencies has to know what the regulations in the common rule are and follow the common rule. So some people, some of you in this room, may have been um, funded by the Department of Health and Human Services in the United States. You probably are very familiar with the common rule. Um, and, and what it requires. The FDA, our regulatory body in the United States, has slightly different regulations and people who are doing research with products that are going to ultimately need approval through FDA need to follow those regulations as well. I know in Brazil there are other regulations. I don't pretend to understand them, but I know Conepi has a big um, presence and there are lots of regulations that I know you all are familiar with. So. Anybody doing research has to know about codes of ethics, has to know about regulations in the country they're in, and sometimes even in a smaller jurisdiction. You know, there are, in the United States, for example, we have state laws that vary sometimes from state to state. I don't know if that's also true in Brazil, but it, it could be. And if you're doing a multinational tr study and you're, you're either in the U.S. or Brazil, but you have partners in somewhere else in the world, you have to know what their laws are as well. So, um, maybe if I push the right button, it would help. So I, I, I'm not going to talk anymore about codes or regulations. What I want to talk about the rest of the time are principles and how to think in a sort of more abstract way about what makes clinical research ethical. And so there are two sets of principles I'm going to talk about. I'm going to briefly talk about the Belmont, what we call the Belmont principles, um, and then I'm going to talk about a framework that a group that I work with developed uh, of principles that guide thinking about the ethics of clinical research. So the Belmont report was one of the reports that came out of the National Commission in the United States that I mentioned already that followed on the heels of the Tuskegee syphilis study. And 
That commission did a number of very important things, but I think one of their most enduring legacies was this report called the Belmont Report. It's, it's also probably their shortest and maybe the easiest to read, um, but they talk about three principles that underlie the, the uh, ethics of clinical research. And the three principles are very familiar principles that are not unique to research in any way, but that can be seen, and very importantly, as guiding the conduct of research. So respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Three very important principles. And in the Belmont Report, um, the commission ap uh, applied respect for persons to the, the concept of getting informed consent in the, in the context of research, so respecting the, uh, the ability of people, the choice of people to decide whether or not they wanted to be in research, um, and also providing protections for those who couldn't give their own consent. Beneficence was applied in the Belmont Report to the idea of um, the benefits of doing a study have to justify the risk, and I'm going to come back to all of these in a little bit. And justice in the Belmont Report was applied to the idea of how you both, how you select subjects and how you understand the outcomes of research in a fair way. So there should be fair selection and there should be fair outcomes in the conducts of research. The other important thing that the Belmont Report did and it's, is that it described a difference between clinical practice and clinical research, that there are some differences and that those difference, differences might be ethically important. And I think this is where I'd like to spend a minute because um, it's not only been the basis for how we understand the ethics of clinical research in some respects, but it's also at this moment in time in history being challenged, cha changing. So simply, and it's much more complicated than this, but the, the differences that people cite between clinical research and clinical care fall into three major categories. The goals, the methods, and the justification for risk to the individuals. So the goals are different in ways that are pro probably pretty obvious. If the goal of clinical research is to generate useful knowledge, and the goal of clinical care is to do what's best for the person in front of you, those are different goals. And they don't always coincide in, in clinical research. And in fact, in clinical research, they sometimes conflict. That sometimes what's best to do for this individual isn't consistent with, with what's the best way to generate useful knowledge. The other thing that differs between clinical research and clinical care often are the methods. Now, you've heard some methods already today. So for example, the example I like to give is the blinding one. I think blinding is a method that's very useful in research, has a reason to use it, and it's often the case that people are double blind. Both the person who's receiving the intervention and the person giving the intervention is blinded to what it is. In a clinical care environment, blinding would be absolutely shocking. You would walk into a doctor's office or a clinic and the doctor would say, I'm going to give you a drug, but I'm not, I don't know what it is, and you're not going to know what it is. That would, be, that would be weird, right? So in clinical research, it's common. In clinical practice, it's very uncommon. And there are other kinds of methods that we use routinely in clinical research that would be very unusual in clinical care. The third is different justification for risk to the individuals. And so what I mean by this is, Certainly not that clinical care doesn't come with risks. Every time you intervene with a drug or a surgery or, an in, or a procedure, there are risks associated with those interventions. However, those risks are justified by the benefit that that intervention or that drug is going to provide or hopefully will provide to that person. In research, we often ask people to do something extra, have an extra blood drawn, have an extra biopsy, answer an extra set of questions, whatever. We ask them to assume burden and risk for the benefit of generating knowledge, not for their benefit. And so that's different too. We don't do that too often in clinical care. So these make clinical research quite different than clinical care. And in important ways, as I mentioned, they come into conflict and some of the conflicts are what creates the ethical challenges that we face. So about 
uh, I don't know, 10 years ago now maybe, um, some, of the, some of the people in my group and myself, we, you know, challenged with the number of different guidances that are out there, the number of different rules and regulations for clinical research. We thought, you know, it's very confusing for people who want to think about what makes clinical research ethical to know how to t where to turn, basically. You have these numerous sets of guidances, and sometimes they actually don't feel like they're saying the same thing. Sometimes they actually don't say the same thing. Sometimes the interpretation is different. So we thought there was a need for a sort of systematic, coherent, universally applicable framework for thinking about the ethics of clinical research. And this is what we came up with, and I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about this. Uh, a list of, some people call them principles or es elements of, of ethical research. And one of, a couple things about this list. One is we think that it makes sense to start at the top and work your way down. So they are sequentially important. Second, as I've already alluded to, we think they're universal. So I think I was thinking, I was listening this morning to the epidemiology talk and thinking, yep, works, works. I think whether it's a clinical trial or an epidemiology, uh, epidemiology study or a cluster randomized trial, I mean, I think there are lots of ways that this framework still is very useful in terms of thinking through what's ethical about research. I think another thing is, although each one has its own sort of set of considerations, it's best understood as a sort of complete package. In other words, you really need to think through all eight of them before, you're, before you should be satisfied that your study is ethical. That doesn't mean that each one applies equally in each case. Sometimes the, the particular one, the particular element here is more challenging in a, in a given case than it might be in another. Secondly, it doesn't mean that it's going to look identical in each case. So, for example, people like to think about informed consent. Informed consent, I think, is best understood as, as appropriately different in different contexts. So exactly how you do it looks different, but the idea of why you're doing it is the same. So that's how we've thought about these principles, and I'm going to talk about each one very briefly. So the first one is collaborative partnership, and it makes sense to us that um, ethical research, because it's about generating useful knowledge for people's health, that it must, in, and it's never one person doing a clinical research study, there's always a team of people, um, that it makes sense to do it collaboratively, that you en engage in partnerships and you collaborate with your partners with respect um, in planning, in conducting, in overseeing the research, in respecting the contributions of each partner, and they might be very different but they are each important to making sure that it gets done. And also in collaborating with the existing systems of healthcare delivery. So that if the goal is to improve health or to somehow introduce a new intervention in some way, there needs to be collaboration with the existing system so that it's integrated into the new system. Otherwise, you've done study with basically no usefulness. Uh, this is probably very hard to see, but I, it's, it's a um, online uh, uh, description of a, a program that's a collaborative endeavor between Brazil and the United States. And I think Dr. Gallen this morning mentioned that there are a number of ways that the NIH, for example, has collaborated with people at Fiocruz and with other people around the country of Brazil. So there are lots of interesting collaborations that are in existence and I think there are more uh, that have recently been launched and I'm sure there are more in the future. So collaborations can be across borders, across um, disciplines, and it can be with researchers in different places. Importantly, it's, it certainly doesn't stop with the researchers or the institutions. Um, that collaborative partnership can be facilitated by working with uh, communities of people, community advisory boards, um, community advocates, um, collaborating investigators, practicing clinicians, and the participants in any given study as well. And I think actually, um, as I understand it, I think Brazil is actually better at inviting the contributions of community partners than the United States is in the conduct of clinical research. So the second 
principle in this framework is social value or what we call or valuable scientific question. So this is, it, it harkens back a little to what Laura Lee said this morning, what is the question? And it goes one step further and says, why is this question important? What is the question and why is it worth asking? Um, and it seems true that ethical clinical research should answer a, a question that's worth answering, a question that can generate new knowledge or understanding about human health or illness, something that will be useful socially, clinically, or scientifically. Um, this is, I think, a little bit common sense, but it's not so easy to think through both why and how. So why? Why does this seem important from an ethical perspective? Well, certainly asking a question that's useful promotes the value of doing research for society. It also has the potential to minimize exploitation because you're not asking people to accept burden or risk for something that's sort of frivolous or useless. You're asking them to accept burden or risk for something that's important. Um, it also, well, I said that already, and it also is a responsible use of the resources that scientists are privileged to have control over. The challenges are, are here. Okay, valuable to whom? Valuable to the participants, valuable to the community in which the participants live, valuable to the future, the future of patients who might have this disease, valuable to some countries, valuable to some company. I mean, you, could, you have to identify who is this answering this question going to be valuable um, to, and in whose view, who's, who's deciding if it's valuable enough. Um, and how, how is value to be judged? I think these are really interesting and important questions. So I have one example that I like to use because I think it's, a, it's an interesting one for a number of reasons. One, this is a study that was done, uh, it was a phase three study of an anti-HIV vaccine that was done in Thailand um, a, a little about 10 years ago. I like this example for the following reason. I think that if we thought about value as do we need an anti-HIV vaccine in the world, would having one be a valuable thing? The answer is I don't think anyone would dispute that. Hands down people would say absolutely it would be great to have a vaccine against HIV. However, it doesn't mean that every single proposed research study that is aiming towards having a vaccine for HIV has value. Some do and some don't. And the value question needs to be asked at different stages along the trajectory as well. So in this case, there was, um, there had been phase one and phase two studies of this vaccine candidate. And after the phase two studies, there was actual public disagreement about whether or not it should proceed to phase three. And this disagreement was expressed in pages and pages of debate in the Science Magazine in 2004. And it's, if you're interested in this kind of area, it's really interesting to go back and look at those debates in Science Magazine. Some saying, absolutely, we have to proceed. It's the only way we're going to find out if this vaccine works. Others saying, it's absolutely unethical to proceed. We don't have strong enough basis from the phase two data to think that it's going to do anything. Interestingly, some eight years later, I think, when the data, or I guess it's five years later, sorry, when the data, when the study was finished and the data came out, there was more disagreement about the value of the study. And it was interesting because the, the disagreement at that point was about what the results showed. Some of it was, the, the vaccine itself was about 32% effective. And so 32% effic efficacy in a, you know, HIV prevention is probably not good enough, but some people said, wow, it's, at least there's a signal here that we can count on. We have a lot of value from the signal. So there was still debate about the value. And the reason I, I show you this is because I think it just exemplifies how value is an important concept, but getting people to really discuss it and agree upon it is not gonna be easy in many cases. Um, these are just two um, recent papers that show that the value of that study continues to come out because they are continuing to do, to do research with samples that were collected from the participants in, those study, in that study, excuse me, and also following the people who became infected and some of the people who didn't become infected. So they're continuing to learn lots about um, the immune correlates of protection and, and Im immune responses to vaccines in HIV. So collaborative partnership, is the question worth asking? 
The third element is valid scientific methodology. And this gets to what you've been hearing about most of the day. And I want to tell you, this is, a, this is an ethical question as well as a scientific question. That you, in order to ethically do a study, not only do you have to have a question that's worth answering, but you have to have a design and methods and um, lots of details that make the answer interpretable so that you know what you've learned. And if you don't do that, you haven't done an ethical study. And yet, it's complicated because there's so many choices that get made along the way, and all of them are value-driven. Scientifically, yes, but value-driven as well. So picking the design, picking the statistical methods, finding the right power, um, making plans for how the data will be collected, how the data will be managed, whether or not it's feasible. These are all important study design and method questions that make a study ethical. One of the things that I was thinking about this morning is um, the, the sort of interesting tension between what is scientifically optimal, the balance of doing the best science, with what constraints might uh, be on those decisions because you're trying to protect the rights and welfare of the people in the study. And that's where this is interestingly challenging in, in terms of ethics. So there are choices, I, I've already alluded to this. Um, what are the endpoints? What's the design? What are the procedures? What are the statistics? I want to say one word about feasibility. I think feasibility is an interesting one that we don't often think about in advance as an ethical requirement. And so I'm sure many of you have been involved with a study in one way or another that wasn't able to be complete, possibly because it was difficult to recruit people, possibly because things changed along the way, possibly because it was harder to do whatever it was during the study than you had anticipated or the data wasn't able, able to be collected in the same way. And so there should be an, a, a sort of an assessment in advance that this study as designed with these methods in, the, in this context is feasible, is doable. Otherwise, you're again, wasting people's time, wasting, exposing people to risk for not being able to answer your question. Um, there are some really specific and interesting challenges in, in this area of scientific validity that people talk about a lot as ethical problems. And they are ethical problems in some respects, but they're also scientific problems. And I want to just mention very quickly two of them. Uh, Placebo-controlled trials have been debated for a long time as you cannot give people placebo because it's unethical. But over time, people have come to agree, actually, that placebo-controlled trials, just writ large, are not unethical, that sometimes they're absolutely necessary from a scientific perspective, and that what you need to uh, consider when you're deciding whether or not placebo is an appropriate design in your trial is scientifically, why is it important? Why is it methodologically important to use a placebo control? And how does that balance against the risks to the individuals who might be not receiving something else. Um, and that's really how those decisions get made. Uh, comparative effectiveness is a, a sort of new thing that people are talking a lot about. And I think one of the interesting questions that um, my own perspective is underdeveloped is what's the appropriate design in a comparative effectiveness study? How do you decide how to design it? And I, I think probably the truth is there isn't one design that fits all cases, that it depends totally on what the, the usual care interventions are that are being uh, compared and why they're being compared. This is a study that, was, that came out of here. Um, you may re recognize the first author. I, I put it up for the following reason. I think that this was a very important finding. This was from the what's called the HPTN 052 study, which showed that uh, treating, <coughs> excuse me, treating people with antiretrovirals who are in serodiscordant couples, uh, where one is HIV infected and the other isn't, and in this study they treated the uninfected partner of the couple, and they were able to show both that. No, sorry, they treated the infected partner. They were able to show that both it, it uh, prevented transmission to the partner, but it also had clinical, this is a secondary outcome, but clinical benefit for the, 
persons who were treated. Okay, so next element is fair subject selection. So you've got partners, a question that's worth asking, a design that's well put into place. Now your question is who? Who do you, who do you include? And it seems to me that there, there are several things that drive this, dis, this determination. One is science. You have to have the right people to answer the scientific question that you're trying to answer. It goes back to the valid design. But choosing people to participate doesn't end with the science or the scientific objectives. It has to include some consideration of the distribution of risks and benefits, both in the trial and post-trial. And it also should include considerations of vulnerability. Who might be vulnerable and who, who might we want to add additional protections for in the case of doing this kind of research. I think one way to think about this fair subject selection, one of my colleagues says, turns it on his head and says, the fairest way to select subjects for research is to assume at the beginning that everyone is eligible. And then figure out what are justified exclusions. And the only justified exclusions probably should be uh, science, what's scientifically inappropriate. So you might justifiably exclude somebody who doesn't have breast cancer if you're testing a breast cancer drug, for example, or somebody, uh, you can make the other examples. And the second justified exclusion might be risk. So you might justifiably exclude somebody from that same trial if they have a renal function that puts them at a particularly high risk from that drug. So there may be reasons of risk and science that should guide your exclusion and inclusion criteria along the way. It's interesting to me from an ethical perspective that there are often on lists of inclusion and exclusion criteria things that don't fit one of those categories. And then there are often questions about including people for reasons that are sort of non-medical. You know, should we include this person because they are difficult to deal with? Or should we exclude this person because they're probably going to be non-compliant? And so those kinds of questions, I think, deserve more scrutiny. It's, it's not that they're never reasons, but they they're certainly shouldn't be uh, loosely applied. Just a word about vulnerability. Um, I find the literature on vulnerability actually quite confusing. I think that there Probably if I asked everybody in this room, you'd have a different answer to me about which populations of people you consider vulnerable. Um, and some lists include so many people that there's nobody else. There's nobody outside of the, the list. So that kind of loses its usefulness, the, the terminology. So I like to think of, when I think about vulnerability, what are people vulnerable to? And in research, the one that we seem to care about the most is people who are uh, sort of ha in a compromised position of protecting their own interests. Okay, so that means either they, have, they don't have the cognitive capacity to understand what you're asking them to participate in, or they're in a position where they're not able really to make a choice. They're compromised in some way from protecting their own interests. And so those people are vulnerable. And by most guidance and most ethical analysis and most rules and regulations, people who are vulnerable in research need extra protections. They need extra protections. The protections should be driven by what they're vulnerable to. So if they're vulnerable to not being able to understand, then the question is, are there ways we can make things more understandable for them? If the answer is no, who can make decisions in their stead? Um, that kind of analysis. Most of the time, People consider children, people in captive situations like prisoners or soldiers um, to be vulnerable. I think that even within the group of people called children, there are people who are more and less vulnerable. You know, you might say a, uh, a neonate has very different interests and very different ability to protect their own interests than a 16-year-old adolescent. And so the vulnerability is not uniform across groups either. This is just a, an example of, of how complicated it is to think about the fair subject selection. This is from a paper that I wrote with a colleague of mine, Bernie Lowe, about HIV cure studies. So this is a new wave in the, 
in the world of HIV is finding uh, interventions that might cure people. And we, we suggested, and uh, this is not out of the blue, this is com comports with much of the guidance that's out there, that you start with the people who can consent, who can give their own consent, and are willing to take on some risks for this research. Um, then later you can move to children and adolescents once you have a promising intervention that you've seen promising in adults or safe and promising in adults. And that the uh, principles of fair subject selection should also be applied to sites. That you should think about how you decide what site to go to also has to be fair and driven by science and risk and vulnerability. Next, favorable risk benefit uh, ratio. Um, question is, okay, we've already decided this is a socially valuable question to answer. So the question here is, are there ways to think about what the benefits and risks are to the individuals in the study in a way that we can minimize risks even further and maximize benefits even further for them? So it's not the risks of doing the study for these people against the social value you've already gone that far. <laughs> In this case, you want to say, what are the risks? Are risks to subjects necessary? And are they minimized? Are they justified by the benefit to the individual subjects and or the importance of the knowledge that you're going to generate by doing this study? And have you maximized the benefits? I think this is a, this brings me back to what I talked about a minute ago about history. I mean, I think for a long time people thought about research as risky and you needed to be protected from it. And so, we, we had our emphasis all on that side. Now some groups of people and, and more and more groups of people think of research as a benefit and so people need access to it. And so I think it's really, a, again, a balancing act between the two. We, we need to protect people but we need to assure that they have access to research both by being able to participate when they're eligible but also that the results are relevant to their needs at the end so clinicians know how to treat them. Lots of challenges in, in identifying risks and benefits. Which risks count is an interesting one. Um, I think this is, again, going back to comparative effectiveness research, this is one of the, is the center of that debate. Which risks of doing research on usual standard care interventions count as research risks and which ones don't? Um, I think a lot of people are arguing about this. There are some pretty straightforward ways to think about it, but lots of discussions. There are also challenges in terms of minimizing and limiting risks. So once we can identify what the risks are, we should always be attentive to trying to minimize them as much as possible. So for example, if your study involves a um, bronchoscopy, you might want to be sure that the people who are doing the bronchoscopy have the right kind of clinical training to be able to do it. That minimizes the risks of that procedure. That's a pretty straightforward thing, something we don't think about as minimizing risks. If, we, if the study involves a series of blood draws and some of them can be drawn at the time that the person is getting blood drawn for clinical purposes, coordinate the schedule. That's a way to minimize risk. So there are things like that. There's also a lot of discussion about direct versus indirect benefits in research. Um, some people think of direct benefits as the benefits that emerge right from the study itself. So whatever you're doing, the benefit of that application, intervention, whatever it is. And those are distinct from the other kinds of benefits that people often do derive from participating in research, like psychological benefit, or feeling good about being altruistic, or helping their communities, or um, getting care that they might not otherwise get. I mean, there are a lot of things that people do get in the context of research, better monitoring. Um, those are important benefits for the individuals. They're less important in terms of justifying the risks. And some people say they shouldn't be used at all in justifying the risks. But importantly, and this goes back to something that, the, that I started with earlier and the Belmont Report says very clearly, in research it is okay to do, it is ethical to do research in which the individual subjects will not benefit. So this statement basically says, interests other than those of the subject can on some occasions be sufficient by themselves to justify the risks involved in the research as long as we protect the rights and the welfare of the subjects. Independent review. 
Okay, this is the next one on the list. Okay, so you've got your partners, your good question, your valid design, you've fairly selected your subjects, you've minimized risks and maximized benefits. Now the, the thing that happens is you submit it to somebody else to look at and make a decision about whether or not ethically it's okay. Now, you might be the investigator writing the study and submitting it to somebody else to review. You might be part of the review committee and you might be reviewing the proposal. And one of the things you should ask yourself is, is this a wor question worth asking? Is the design appropriate? Have the subjects been, uh, recruitment and inclusion and exclusion criteria been fairly described? Are the risks minimized? All of those things. So if you're, the, if you're a part of this, if you only get in at this stage, you still can use these criteria uh, to help you. And so basically the independent review, usually done by an ethics committee or an IRB, is to ensure that requirements have been fulfilled, to check any biases that investigators might have, and to ensure the public that we're paying attention, that this is not making people guinea pigs, that we're doing good, rigorous science. There are a lot of challenges with independent review. Um, these are universal. I, 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 I have heard that you have some of these here. I know we have them in the United States. They include things like just the volume of research that a committee has to review. Sometimes it's huge. And the amount of time that any committee can spend on one study is pretty limited. That, you know, that's a problem in some cases. There are conflicts. There are conflicts within committees. There are conflicts between committees. That's a, that can be a problem. There is documented inconsistencies. So one committee decides one thing based on risk and the other committee decides something else based on risk. And then you say, well, how can that be? You know, they, they just see risk in different ways. So inconsistencies is, is hard to explain in certain cases, but it also can be a big problem, especially when there are multi-center studies. Um, Switching to the seventh out of the eighth, informed consent. Okay, so one of the things that I think is important to point out, at least from my perspective and from many people who ag agree with me on this, is that informed consent is important for clinical research, but it comes after lots of other things are in place. In other words, you don't even ask people to participate until you're sure you've got a good study. And so it's really interesting, I mean, some of the examples that John gave this morning about um, you know, inoculation studies that were done and, and condemned because they didn't have the person's informed consent. Well, some of those studies would not have been ethical even if they did have people's consent. Not that they may have gotten it, but they, they might not have been ethically appropriate anyway. So what is informed consent? It basically allows individuals to have the information that they need and the opportunity that they need to decide whether or not they want to participate and whether or not they want to stay in a study. That's what informed consent is supposed to be. Uh, seems pretty important from an ethical perspective. It does involve a number of different elements that most people agree on. There's a disclosure of information, and a lot of the rules are about what that information should look like. People should understand the information. There should be a voluntary choice and then the person has to authorize that they've made that choice. Now, I don't know if you can see my picture in the corner. This is a cartoon which is kind of funny, but not really very funny. It's, it's not what informed consent should look like. You know, the, the guys in trench coats with their cigars standing around this poor person at a table with a pen in his hand. Um, unfortunately, there are examples of this that I've witnessed in life, I'm sure you have too. But most of the time, this isn't what informed consent looks like, and it's not what it's supposed to look like. There are two concepts that come into play a lot in the discussions about informed consent, and these are both concepts that have to do with really whether or not or how choice might be influenced. So it's not anything really about information or how people understand information. It's more about, is the person in, an, in a position to be able to make a choice? And coercion, generally the worst of these two, the worser of these two, if that's the word, um, basically is understood as you threaten to make somebody worth, worse off if they don't say yes. So in the context of research, that would be like saying to a prisoner, you know, we're gonna give you more time unless you participate in this study. 
to saying to a patient, his or her doctor saying to the patient, unless you participate in my study, I'm not going to take care of you anymore. I mean, those things are coercive. Coercion in, in clinical research, I think today, is pretty uncommon. I don't think it happens very often, and I think it's because we have so many protections in place. But it does happen occasionally. Undue influence, on the other hand, is a different animal. Uh, it's, per, it's, it's not as well understood, I think. Uh, people think of it as something that influences you to take on risks that you otherwise wouldn't take on or to do something to which you have objections. So the, the sort of paradigmatic example, which I'm not sure I agree with, I'll just tell you, is if you give somebody enough money to participate in a study, they won't even look at the risks. They'll just say, yeah, sure, give me the money, I'll do it. Um, my understanding is that paying people to be in research is not so common in Brazil. Maybe it's, a, it's a not allowed even. But I think there are other ways that people are at least purportedly unduly influenced to participate in a study. So if you say to somebody, we'll take care of you for the rest of your life, that might make somebody want to do something in a study that they otherwise really wouldn't want to do or have objections to. So I think it's an interesting concept and one that people need uh, to think about when they're designing their studies. Um, interestingly, and probably not surprisingly, most people believe that informed consent is important, but data accumulated over decades, actually, has shown that we don't do a very good job. So if you, if you look at the empirical data on research participants and how much they understand about the studies that they've signed up for, that they've given their informed consent to, it's not very good. Um, for the most part, people are often able to say they are in research or that maybe this uh, substance that they're being given or that is not approved, but they're much less likely to be able to say to you, that they understand what randomization is. Or they might say, I know that 50% of the people in this study are going to get this drug and 50% are going to get that drug. My doctor's going to give me the one that they think is best for me. So they don't understand randomization and how it applies to themselves. There are also data to show, these are two studies that I just put up. There are tons of them out there. The, the, the one on the left is one that we did where we actually accumulated a bunch of different studies on the quality of informed consent from a number of different countries around the world, and we were able to show two basic conclusions. One is <coughs> the amount of understanding is quite variable across settings and across countries. There's no, you know, one place does it better than the other. <coughs> it does vary with the type of information that you want to test people to have. And the other thing is about uh, choice, about voluntariness, that in general, the studies that we looked at that were done in the developing world, people were less likely to know or to say they knew that they could have said no to the study or that they would get good care if they didn't participate. This study on the, on the right, on your right, is a study that was done in Brazil that was looking at uh, understanding within a particular cohort of mothers enrolling their children. And basically, they came to a fairly similar conclusion in this one cohort, that the understanding was quite variable, not as good as we would want it to be, and that some people felt like they had no choice. All right, last of my eight um, is what we called respect for enrolled subjects. So this is, this is not something that you see, at least in these words, in almost any code of ethics, other code of ethics, but the elements of it are. And basically, the idea behind this was the following, that we were noticing that many people who, even researchers, often thought, okay, ethics. I have to take my study to the IRB or the review committee, and I have to get informed consent, then I'm done. Ethics is over. I've done it. And we thought, that can't be right. That can't be right. You've just started to engage these people, right? So you have a whole host of responsibilities, ethical responsibilities, to the people that you've engaged in research, whether that's individuals or communities or both. And those include things like making sure you're protecting their confidentiality, making sure they know they can stop if they want to, um, monitoring their welfare, monitoring, period, but monitoring their welfare, monitoring the data, 
giving them new information if it becomes relevant, and planning for what happens at the end. And I'm sure there's a longer list than this, but at least it includes those. There are some interesting current challenges, I think, that people have been struggling with, at least in the United States, and I suspect here as well. Um, confidentiality, how you protect confidentiality in the era of so much data, so much interchange of data, and much less ability to de-identify data than we used to have because of the ability of, of genomic sequencing. Lots of discussions about incidental findings. What do you do when you're doing research and you come across something? This has come up mostly in the context of, of whole genome se sequencing, but it's not only there, it's everywhere. What happens at the end of the trial? Um, I think this is a, I just came from a conference a couple of days ago where we spent two days talking about this. And I think again, and I'm going to come to this in the next slide, Brazil is sort of, uh, in many respects, a leader in this regard, but also has created some problems, I think, uh, by being a leader in this regard. And then there's a lot of discussion still about what the appropriate mechanisms are that need to be put in place for treating people for uh, research-related injuries. So just two quick things about post-trial access in the United States, I mean in Brazil, excuse me. Um, I understand there's a law that says the sponsor is required to provide treatment at the end of a study if it's shown to be beneficial. And I have a colleague, some of you may know her, Sonia Danese, who's in Sao Paulo. Uh, she's done a lot of research on this and she and I have talked over years and collaborated on some research on this issue, mostly in, look at, in terms of looking at what, what is actually being done and what do people think about it, both participants and researchers and review committee members. Um, so I think what's interesting, I don't know how many of you might know Daniel Wang, but he wrote this paper uh, not too long ago where he was looking at what's happening in Brazil where there's this law that says sponsors are required to provide a drug at the end of the trial and there's also a law that says health is a, is a right. And so what's happening in certain cases is that people are suing either the sponsor or the government or both in order to get access to a drug. And he contends, again, I don't know the story, but he contends in the paper that in some cases the, the pharmaceutical sponsors are telling the participant, sue the government. And in other cases, the government is saying, sue the company. So that, so that there's this sort of back and forth, um, which is creating problems, I think, for, some, for lots of um, people. So that's our eight, our eight our framework of eight principles for what makes clinical research ethical. This is just the same ones listed again. I think, as I mentioned to you, I think that um, they should be thought of sequentially. They should be implemented appropriately in context, and they should apply to pretty much any kind of research that you might be thinking of doing or doing. Um, I said that. Um, I think interestingly, in order to sort of make sure that research is ethical, uh, people like you and me need to sit in a room together and learn together about what makes research ethical. And some of these things are not they're not black and white. That makes them what's, that actually, for me, is what makes them so interesting. But they benefit from smart people talking to each other about what are the challenges, how do we overcome them, how do we think about them, and shaping the future by also doing research in ethics. Some of you can do that, some of you may have done that. Um, I think I actually will stop with this slide. I think there are some just just to highlight a couple of things that are happening right now that have created some interesting challenges. None of which, I don't think, have raised brand new issues, but they're creating nuances in some of the issues that, that we've already been discussing. So the multi-site and multinational studies, the issues that are arising are different standards in different places or different judgments made by ethics committees in different places. And it's a real challenge to figure out how to reconcile different views about what makes this study okay and keep it scientifically valid at the same time. So it's a, it's a real challenge. And for many people trying to do multi-center research, it creates an almost inexcusable delay in getting their research started. Because if they have to go to 100 ethics committees in 100 different places and they get multiple 
different kinds of responses, then they have to go back and make sure that the, the hundred committees agree on the changes that they might have made. Um, so in some cases, research has been delayed by years because of disagreements among ethics committees. We've had a lot of debate in the United States about this movement towards what are called learning healthcare systems. And learning, uh, learning healthcare system is, the idea is that you take a clinical setting where people are getting clinical care and you create um, mechanisms for generating data and gathering evidence in that context so that you're sort of merging the world of clinical care and clinical research. And it's raised a lot of interesting issues and a lot of debates about how do you do that ethically and can you sort of tell people at the beginning, you're coming into this learning healthcare system, therefore some things we're not gonna ask you about specifically or do you have to ask everybody about everything specifically? I mean, that kind of debate has been ongoing. Comparative effectiveness research I've already mentioned several times. <clears throat> I think two other things that are still raising lots of questions and lots of discussion, um, probably here as well as in the United States and many other countries around the world are, what's the ethically appropriate way to do research with s samples or data that have been collected before? How do you use them? What kind of consent did people have to give to them at the front end? Does some kind of review have to take place at this end and, and what does that review entail? Lots of interesting discussions and on the in the era of we're only gonna get more, more databases, more biobanks, more um, collections of specimens and, and data for use. And lots of ways to connect them as well, to interconnect them. And then the last is we've had a lot of debate where I live in uh, genomic, generating genomic data and sharing genomic data. And what kinds of challenges that creates especially for certain populations, indigenous populations in the United States, for example, who do not want their genetic data shared with anybody outside of their community, and they also don't want certain kinds of research studies done with their genetic data. And so there's, there's a lot of discussion about how far, you know, the, the, the benefits of sharing data across lots of places are huge, but the challenges in terms of protecting the rights and welfare of the people from whom those data come and those specimens come are also huge. So I will end with, I go back to this is the balance that we always have to try to preserve and obrigada. I think I have some time for questions or comments or challenges. É, nós discutimos aqui na Fiocruz, durante essas duas últimas semanas, é, um simpósio de ética. E o Brasil tem leis muito duras ou normas rigorosas em relação à condução de ensaios clínicos. E uma das coisas que, que o Brasil exige é que haja do patrocinador não é, a continuidade do tratamento pós o, o término do estudo, quando o participante foi beneficiado com ele. E outra coisa que eu queria perguntar para você é em relação ao placebo. Aqui no Brasil, quando há uma medicação consagrada para tratar uma determinada doença, é proibido usar o placebo versus nova medicação. Obrigado. Ok. So the first question had to do with uh, um, what happens at the end of the trial. And my understanding is, as you said, that the Brazilian law says that sponsors have to provide an intervention if somebody's doing well on it at the end of the trial. Right? Isn't that what you said? Um, I think what's interesting about that is, as far as I can tell, you're the only country in the world that requires that by law. And there's a lot of debate among sponsors of clinical trials, but also among researchers and uh, regulators and ethicists about the sort of the basis for that requirement, the ethical basis for that requirement, 
but also the sort of unintended consequences of that requirement. So let me say one thing about each one. The basis is, okay, maybe it's because people are benefiting, you don't want them to mm, stop benefiting from something they're benefiting from, right? Uh, they should be getting treated. The question is really, why does that therefore put the obligation on the sponsor? Um, and if you think about, you know, if you're asking people to participate in research and they're taking on risks for the benefit of others, and maybe you owe them something for that reason, then maybe the people who didn't benefit are the ones that you should be most worried about and not the ones who did. So I think people should continue to get treatment that they're benefiting from, but the question is why is it the sponsor's obligation And that? I know Brazil has that law, and the question is why. Uh, I think the, uh, the unintended consequences of that fall into a couple of areas. One is the one that I mentioned with the paper that Daniel Wang wrote, and that is in some cases, people are s suing the sponsor, but in, in other cases, the sponsor is telling them, no, sue the government. The government is required to give you um, interventions that will help you and that are approved. And so there is this sort of competing, uh, the, the number of suits is still very small as I understand it, but there is a sort of competing tension between whose responsibility is it to provide those treatments over the long term. And the most recent, uh, maybe you're aware of this, the most recent uh, Declaration of Helsinki has revised their paragraph on this topic. And two things that it did, which are different from previous ones, in the first, I don't remember it by heart, but in the, pr in the first line of that paragraph, it says, researchers, sponsors, and host country governments are responsible. And so all of a sudden you have this partnership or this mix of people responsible, which is in many respects a step forward, but it's also less clear to people what are they supposed to do. The other possible intended consequence, and I don't know this, and I don't know that anyone knows this, but it is worth somebody looking into. Uh, there were some pharmaceutical sponsors at this meeting that I mentioned who said, because of that, for certain kinds of trials, they don't go to Brazil. They go elsewhere. So, I mean, I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's possibly a reality. So the second thing you asked about was placebo. And um, it's a contentious issue, and I'm out of time here, but a uh, very contentious issue. I think, again, you could follow the sort of debate that's been going on about this in the international context since maybe the revision of Helsinki in 2000. Um, but it's interesting to me to note that um, most people agree with the default that you suggested is, is true here. That if there is a proven effective treatment for some condition, then it's very difficult to justify doing a placebo controlled trial. But notice I said very difficult and not impossible. That there might be cases in which for scientific reasons, for social value reasons, for, I don't know, there could be compelling reasons that a placebo might be appropriate, and, and then you need consideration of the risk, the risk to the individuals in the study who are not getting the effective therapy. And so some people have said, for example, these uh, trials like Laura Lee was talking about, where you start the intervention later, a delayed intervention. That's not a placebo-controlled trial, but in, in essence, it gives you some of the same scientific um, rigor that you might get from placebo control. So there's a lot of debate about that, too. Thank you.